the ultimate secret weapon. Hello, and welcome to Film Rant. This time we review Marvel's Ant-Man. Heads up for those who are scared of the paranormal though, because this film is a little bit haunted. Before we get into anything, I'll warn that this review, as usual, contains spoilers. So with that out of the way, let's dive in. We'll begin with the characters. Marvel opted to go off the comics a little in on making Hank Pym, played by Marty McFly's dad, also known as Michael Douglas, the Ant-Man this film focuses on. Instead, Hank Pym was the original Ant-Man, but decides to give it up when his wife goes subatomic and dies. This is basically where she shrinks into complete non-existence, a little like what happens to X-Factor winners or Natalie Imbruglia. Instead, the film focuses on Scott Lang, played by the glorious creature that we know as Paul Rudd. I'll let you in on his secrets. I, um, I love Paul Rudd. Like, genuinely, like, pure, utter man love there. I can be your hero, baby. I can kiss away the pain. Oh, yeah. I will stand by you forever. You can take my breath away. Anyway. Paul Rudd's introduction to the MCU, which is the Marvel Cinematic Universe for those of you who aren't on the ball with superhero stuff, is very well received. I was worried when he was announced as the lead as I just didn't think he would fit in with Marvel's content, but he really does. Paul Rudd is probably the one actor I'd seen the most out of the main MCU cast, so it's a testament to the film that I saw Paul Rudd's character as a distinguished individual and not just Brian Fantana in a fancy costume. They've done studies, you know, 60% of the time it works every time. That doesn't make sense. Scott Lang is a lovable guy who just ended up on the wrong side of the tracks. He plays the Robin Hood archetype in that he's in prison for literally stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. When he leaves prison, he returns to crime in order to try and get some money for his daughter, as he can't hold down a job with a criminal record. He's then picked up by Hank Pym, who notices his talents and decides he's not really a bad guy, so he'll give him a shot at being a hero. He then becomes the hero that San Francisco deserves, but doesn't need right now, because, you know, the Avengers and that. So yeah, Scott is moulded by Hank into a hero from the Robin Hood villain he once was. It's not the first time we've seen this storyline though. If any of you care to even look back at Spider-Man 3 again, I say this to appeal to the majority. Personally, I really like Spider-Man 3. You can unsubscribe now if you want. You'll see that the story arc of Flint Marco is remarkably similar. Marco escapes from prison when he becomes the Sandman, he then turns to crime in order to provide for his daughter. He's desperate, much like Scott. Only Marco is apprehended by Spider-Man, so he's now the villain. Furthermore, he's then picked up and convinced to potentially kill loads of people by Venom, and not turned into a hero by Hank Pym. Now Scott wouldn't kill anybody, but the similarity is there. Obviously Spider-Man 3 is before the days of the MCU, so it's not related at all, but as a Marvel property, I feel it's important to mention the similarities. Scott's story is perfectly fine, it's just nothing we haven't seen before. Exactly the same can be said for the villain. Ant-Man contains possibly the weakest villain in the MCU. Darren Cross, played by Corey Stoll, works for Pym's business. He wants to crack the Pym particles so that he can be in control of the good shrinkiness that Scott and Hank have for themselves. The only different being that Stoll wants to weaponize the particle, and he strikes a deal with Hydra. So here we have a villain that sees his boss create a revolutionary new piece of tech but won't weaponize it, so he takes it upon himself to replicate said tech and sell it to the military or weapons organization. Now, where have we seen that before? That's right, Iron Man. The villain in Iron Man is exactly the same. Exactly the same. Even down to the baldness. Plus Iron Man is part of the MCU, so having two identical villains in the same universe is a bit weak on Marvel's part. I'll say this with a number of issues Ant-Man has, but I wonder if this is a result of Edgar Wright's departure. Strangely, there's not much to say about Hank Pym himself. Michael Douglas, as usual, does a good job. He does fit the typical scientist trope of, hey, I'll create this, it's dangerous, but I'll create it, then something bad happens with it and they regret everything they've ever done. The terrorists are planning to use Metal Gear to launch a nuclear missile. You telling me you didn't know? They're gonna put a dismantled warhead into Metal Gear's TMD missile module? Great Scott! Again, his character is predictable, but it isn't a bad watch. The female lead, played by Evangeline Lilly, is good too. There's not really much to her though. Her purpose seems to simply be to help Paul Rudd gel with the ants and train him to fight. Oh, and be the person he kisses at the end. 
because every superhero needs a dame that can smooch at some point, right? Ugh, it just doesn't need to be there. It's not bad as such, it's just boring. Having just seen Jurassic World though, I just saw Evangeline Lilly's character as Claire Deering with her hair dyed. Seriously, the similarities are through the roof. Anyway, Ant-Man is a very slow film to begin with. Before you get into any real action, you're looking at a good hour or so. The beginning of the film basically just sets everything up. Literally everything. There's nothing here that's left to the audience to figure out. It's literally all there, with no engagement for the audience. When a film is too ambiguous, it's bad. But when things just go on a bit too long, that could either be shortened or skipped altogether, that's bad too. There needs to be a happy medium. Bruce Wayne returning to Gotham and The Dark Knight Rises is a little too long of a gap, but the beginning of Ant-Man leaves no stone unturned. It leaves you understanding the entire film perfectly, which is a good thing, but when you go to a superhero movie you expect to get to the fight scenes fairly quickly. Ant-Man takes its time. It's not boring, not at all. It just seems like a long wait before you get into anything other than talking or training montages. A strong positive for Ant-Man is the comedy. Like Guardians of the Galaxy, Ant-Man is very light-hearted and riddled with jokes. I suppose it has to be, because making a man shrink to the size of an ant and then subsequently control him like an army is just an absolutely ridiculous idea. Along the same lines as Bradley Cooper playing a raccoon and Vin Diesel voicing a tree. I am Groot. Yep, that's Marvel for you. So yeah, the comedy is great. Paul Rudd shows his comedic prowess throughout the film. Michael Douglas also chimes in with a few brilliantly delivered lines. But the standout comic character in the film by far is Michael Peña. And if you don't know who Michael Peña is, have you ever seen any movie ever? Well, he's a Mexican guy. In Ant-Man, he plays Luis, who, you guessed it, is Mexican. He, without doubt, is the funniest character in the film. His delivery and the dialogue itself is genuinely funny. He sort of has a character motif which involves him telling really long stories with lots of useless details. They're both brilliantly funny. We'll go into those a bit later, though. I love how self-aware Ant-Man is, although it's a bit bipolar. There's a scene in which Michael Douglas explains to Paul Rudd about becoming a hero and how he should be the hero his daughter thinks he is. Words to that effect, at least. Oh well, yeah, actually, the word hero was thrown about a lot in this movie. Other Marvel properties seem to avoid using it by calling the protagonist a soldier or a billionaire playboy philanthropist or just using the term Avenger. It just seems a bit forced when they keep using the word hero. Be a hero, Scott. Be a superhero, because you need to be a superhero, otherwise this superhero movie will suck, it needs superheroes, hero, heroes. I prefer it when they skirt around it a little, but that could just be me. Anyway, after Hank Pym makes his speech, Paul Rudd just takes in what he's heard and sarcastically says, well, wow, that was an amazing speech. It was nice to see the film acknowledge the Hollywood dialogue in this way. There's another scene later on where Michael Douglas and Evangeline Lilly are having an emotional dramatic moment about the death of her mother. The camera then just pans to show Paul Rudd is still in the room. This is called a behind the black, and it's used for comedic effect in a lot of films and TV shows. Once Paul Rudd is seen, he says, Oh, look at you two bonding, which totally unravels the dramatic tension. He then points out that he ruined a good moment, then jumps out the room. It was nice to see such a dramatic moment be played with like that, because let's face it, real life just isn't that dramatic, and Ant-Man knows this, for the most part. There are times where the subversion of Hollywood drama seems a bit odd, because Ant-Man conforms to the typical Hollywood tropes too. A lot of them. As I mentioned earlier, Scott acknowledges that Hank makes quite a long and clearly pre-written and prepared speech. The film pokes fun at the idea. But then later in the film, the exact same thing happens again, only this time nobody questions it. Ant-Man is inconsistent with the tropes it exposes and the ones it chooses to actually use. It's not bad as such, it just makes the film feel a bit wonky with its comedy. Now one thing I will say about Ant-Man is that finally, finally Marvel realised the big plot error in their films since the Avengers. When Scott learns what Hank needs him to do in order to save the world, Scott immediately asks, well, why not just call in the Avengers? Hank replies to this saying that he doesn't want Stark to get a hold of his tech, as he's hid it from him for years. In the face of global destruction, I sort of think you should let that go, Hank, but whatever. At least Marvel answered the question in this movie. Ever since the Avengers in every movie, besides Guardians of the Galaxy, I've questioned why doesn't Cap get Iron Man to help him fight Hydra, or why doesn't Tony get Bruce Banner to help him defeat the Mandarin? It seems in those films, Marvel just couldn't be asked to come up with a decent enough reason for their audience. The reason in that man isn't great, but it's there at least. Thank you, Marvel. Thank you. 
There's a scene about halfway through the film where Scott is tasked to retrieve a piece of Pimtech from one of Howard Stark's old bunkers. It turns out that the bunker is now the main HQ for the Avengers. So when Scott arrives, we get our token Avenger scene in the form of Falcon. I feel bad for Anthony Mackie. Aside from Cap 2, he seems to be used as a cameo appearance almost as much as Stan Lee. Ultimately, this scene didn't really need to take place at the Avengers facility. It literally could have been any random bunker in any random city. I've heard a lot of people generalise the MCU movies as simply being a big commercial for the next one. At first, I disagreed. A lot of the intertextuality is very playful and fun, but in Ant-Man it wasn't really needed. I didn't not enjoy it, it was a fun scene to be honest, but I did feel like Marvel just put it there to say, remember the Avengers guys, that's the next big film, sort of. One final element of the script I want to mention is Scott's friends from his criminal life. It's cool that Scott still has his thief friends who always have his back, as they actually serve some purpose to the overall plot. It's just interesting that his three friends are Mexican, Eastern European, and black. Now that's fine, but there's a trend in movies where these types of characters are portrayed in a negative light. Yeah, you can argue they all actually seem like nice funny guys, which they are, but let's not forget that these three are only into thieving for the money, and the money alone. Paul Rudd, being the white guy, is made to be the odd one out of the group. He's the Robin Hood who steals to help people for a good and selfless reason, so Paul Rudd as the white dude is the shining hero of the group, whereas his three companions are just petty criminals. Read into that what you will. Now then, we'll move on to the technical issues. As I mentioned at the start, the film is incredibly haunted, and the identity of this poltergeist is Edgar Wright. Now I'm not sure how versed you are in the history of Ant-Man's production, but Edgar Wright was originally hired to pen the script and direct the movie. Before shooting, Wright departed the set after a dispute with Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige. Wright wanted to go somewhere with the script that Kevin Feige didn't like. Before shooting, Feige continually asked for rewrites of the script until eventually Wright just went, you know what, saw this like, and left the project. I do really wonder what Wright wanted to do with the film, and if it would have been better than what we got. I suspect it probably would have been. However, some of Wright's input of the script remained, and there's little droplets of him fluttering about in the final production. As I mentioned earlier, Michael Peña's character Luis likes to tell really long stories full of unnecessary details. As he's telling these stories, the editing swiftly cuts through clips of what he's talking about, with fast camera movements and quick cutting. This is pretty much trademark Edgar Wright. I thoroughly enjoyed it, as I'm a big fan of Edgar Wright's work. Most people credit him because of Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz, which are great films, but my personal favourite would be Scott Pilgrim. That's another discussion though, so back on track. Wright uses this same storytelling technique in Shaun of the Dead. So yeah, this is one element of Wright's direction in writing that managed to seep through the cracks. Even in the dialogue too. Ant-Man's dialogue at times is very colloquial and clearly written for comedic purposes, especially Luis's dialogue. In fact, the way Paul Rudd and his pals talk to each other isn't too different to that of Nick Frost and Simon Pegg's characters. They have some good banter, and it's hilarious to watch. I assume that a hefty chunk of Wright's script remained untouched as he picks up a screenwriting credit, but there was definitely some parts where some righteousness... eh? was needed. There's a thing Wright likes to do with items. If a character needs to get dressed or prepare for something, Wright often cuts to close-ups of the items being picked up or put on, and cuts quickly between. It's an effective way of showing the inventory of a character and a great way to show somebody getting ready like a badass. It's also good for comedic effect. There was times in the movie where this little feature could have been implemented. It wasn't bad that they didn't have it, but I did notice that if Wright was at the helm, it would have probably been done in his style. Peyton Reed does a good job as director, the film he's came out with is perfectly fine. I just feel that like Edgar Wright would have had a bit more style and distinguished it as a great film by itself, similar to what James Gunn did with Guardians of the Galaxy. A key point worth mentioning has to be the sound design, notably on the ants. It's fantastic. I love the way they made the ants sound like horses whenever Scott was rolling with them. The heavy stomps and the stampede-like noises when the army of ants were attacking were brilliant. One element of the sound design that irked me a little bit though was that Yellow Jacket's gun was pretty much identical to the sound of the blasters from Star Wars. Fuck you, Disney! Some people may disagree with me on this last criticism, but I just can't shake it. I strongly feel that Ant-Man's biggest flaw is that it just doesn't fit in the MCU. Even with the token Avengers scene, I just can't see Ant-Man interacting or even existing with the Avengers in a realistic way. This probably has something to do with the tone of the movies. All of the Avengers movies have quite a serious and realistic theme throughout. Ant-Man had to make itself silly in order for it not to come across as, well, silly. 
I just feel a clash of tones is something that Marvel will struggle with when their characters mix. Guardians of the Galaxy had a similar tone to Ant-Man, it was just crazy stupid fun. But I can just manage to see Guardians of the Galaxy mixing with the Avengers series. They'll probably just play off Guardians as the big silly group of heroes who manage to help out the big serious ones. I suspect that's probably what they'll do with Ant-Man too. Only time will tell. To be honest, the tone I was comparing Ant-Man to, and this was probably a bad idea, was Daredevil. Daredevil is ultra dark and ultra serious. I'll just state for the record though, that I love Daredevil. It's Marvel's best product in the MCU, hands down. It'll never happen, but imagine Ant-Man in Daredevil. It's ridiculous, isn't it? I know that's not a great way to look at it, but all these characters are meant to coexist, and for the most part, I can't really buy it. Looking closer though, maybe it's Daredevil that's the odd one out here, and not Ant-Man. I would like to end on a point that was already really proven with Guardians of the Galaxy. And that point is that Marvel is at a stage now where they can make absolutely fucking anything, and people, including me, will happily dish out their dollar to watch it. I mean, Guardians wasn't that big of a Marvel property, but they were like, hey, you know what? We can get Bradley Cooper to voice a raccoon and Vin Diesel to play a tree. People will love that shit. They were right. It also helped that Chris Pratt really rose in popularity just before Guardians released, so Marvel really won the lottery there. The next time, or even first time you watch Ant-Man, just distance yourself from it for a minute or two, and truly contemplate how absolutely ridiculous the whole thing is. It's great, but it's really, really stupid. I'm sort of glad Marvel are making these kind of films though. It shows that they aren't scared to try and transfer any of the more strange characters to the big screen, and I look forward to what comes after Phase 3. Ant-Man gets 3.5 frames out of 5. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Film Rant. Well, it wouldn't be a Marvel review if I didn't do a post-credits review of the post-credits scene now, would it? I'll be as brief as they are though. First scene, advertising. Wasp? Ant-Man 2? I don't know, but I liked it. Second scene, so they just found the Winter Soldier now? Wow, well, that was an underwhelming subplot. But damn, it's the Winter Soldier. I love that guy. 